could be rewriting the genome of the patient to treat a disease. Yes, uh, today we have technologies by which we can rewrite any letter of our genome so that when a mutation appears that causes a particular disease could be reversed so that the mutation is corrected and the disease disappears. The problem always is the efficiency. How much efficient we are to try to fix that mutation. Right now the technologies in the basic laboratory are not that high and this is one of the key aspects where we are focusing our attention. To have enough efficiency to correct the mutation so that the phenotype also disappears. But yes, at this moment certainly most of the mutations could be fixed. The aging is a major risk factor for most human diseases. Could epigenetic reprogramming of aging be the answer? Aging is a, as you said, the major risk factor for any disease. But also we know very little about what determines the process of aging. We know more and more that the epigenetics has an important role. I always like this example of a colony of ants. We see the worker and we see the queen. They have the same genome, but one lives longer than the other and that's due to the difference in epigenetics the way it behaves the ambient the, what it eats all these things that constitute a different epigenetic pattern make clearly a different aging process it's not the only one there are many other factors but altering and modifying the epigenetics of our cells certainly can reverse or at, at least slow down the process of aging. And therefore, if we have ways to do this in a safe manner, why not? Certainly could be a way to try to slow down aging, which in the end, the major purpose will be to delay the appearance of diseases. Because as we said at the beginning, the major risk factor for the appearance of a disease is aging. If we delay aging, it will take longer for the disease to appear. We have had many advances in basic science. How move to the clinic? It's always very difficult to translate what we see in an animal model like the mouse into a human being. We're a different organism. So that has been always a problem. But nonetheless, uh, more and more we now can work with human cells. And therefore, the bridge between the basic laboratory and the clinic could be shortened. Factors where we could improve to make that transition a little bit faster will be mm, better interactions between the basic scientists and the clinicians. We are too busy. The clinician is too busy saving the life of patients and the basic uh, scientist is to be busy trying to understand mechanisms in animal models to do that. And this, unfortunately, there are not enough structures that allow us to interact and talk to one another to focus and to try to shorten the period by which one discovery in the lab can be translated to the clinic. Another aspect is the regulatory aspect. By far, science moves much faster than the regulatory bodies can. And this, in a way, slows down the process of translation into the clinic. Uh, bigger awareness by the society, by the politicians of what we do in the lab will help to shorten the gap between the basic science lab and the clinic. There is also an uh, ethical uh, issue. Obviously, there is uh, every time we do something that was not there before, we need to wonder, should we or should not we do it? I am of the opinion that not everything that can be done in the lab should be done. 
At the same time, we all realize that our ethical standards, they change when we see that it's something is good for humankind. I always like to put the example of the first kidney transplant. The doctor that did it for the first time had to face many problems, mainly ethical problems. After he got the Nobel Prize and today kidney transplantation saved the lives of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people every year. So just to see that something is working make us realizing that maybe our ethical standards need to be changed every now and then.